Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're continuing our mini-series deep dive into Total War Warhammer 3 speculation and taking a look at the Demons of Slaanesh. A very likely contender for one of the launch factions in Total War Warhammer 3, whether we see the Demons of Chaos as one giant faction or we see them as four separate factions plus Chaos Undivided for a fifth, I think Slaanesh is likely to see representation early on in the life of the game. The Dark Prince, the Prince of Pleasure, the Lord of Excess, the Perfect Prince, the Prince of Chaos, an excess of alternate names fits this hermaphroditic god of obsession, the master of excess in all things. Referred to interchangeably as he, she, and perhaps they, Slaanesh is most often referred to and assumed to be male with an androgynous appearance, and so I'll be referring to him as such throughout today's conversation. Typically associated with lust and pursuits of the flesh, Slaanesh actually has many more extremely interesting facets. Everything from beautiful, vibrant art to particularly expressive song or dance to hubris, pride, and hedonism all fall under the realm of Slaanesh. And despite being the youngest and perhaps presently weakest of the Chaos Gods, the other ruinous powers supposedly fear Slaanesh and his potential to grow infinitely stronger. After all, war, plague, and schemes come to an end. But the selfishness of man and the pursuit of pleasure and self-fulfillment knows no end. And if watching these speculation videos gives you pleasure, make sure you subscribe to keep up with the speculation videos I'll be releasing. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. I hope that wasn't excessive. So how does all this translate into Total War? Well, like I've said before, I think each of the Chaos Gods are going to be getting their own dedicated factions, and while I've constantly referred to them as the Demons of Chaos, I think the reality is that we're going to be seeing these factions be a blend of both demons and warriors of each of the Ruinous Powers. In other words, there will be room for empire building as the Warriors of Chaos, but the demons of each particular god will accompany the mortal armies into battle and perhaps even act as agents when fitting. It's possible that, at launch, we're going to see one sub-faction led by a champion and another led by a greater demon, with a champion taking charge of one of the northern tribes. I have some theories with regards to how that might be made a bit more interesting, but let's leave the wilder speculations to the end of the video, and let's start with some things that are at least a bit more grounded, if not certain. Let's start with talk of battlefield mechanics and units. Slaanesh is often synonymous with speed. Not only does it refer to the prolific drug use, but it also gives Slaanesh an aspect in which his warriors and demons can outshine the other gods. It certainly isn't strength, sorcery, or support, the domains of Korn, Cinch, and Nurgle, respectively. I think this specialization will be evident in overall stats, visible and hidden. By this, I mean we can expect to see higher movement speeds, higher charge speeds, and shorter attack intervals, the latter being especially helpful in balancing out lower weapon strength. This might also translate into a large number of Slaaneshi units being able to vanguard deploy, a way to represent the speed and eagerness with which they move into battle. Slaanesh is also synonymous with sexiness, and what's sexier than partial nudity? I think this will be reflected in relatively low armor stats across the board, balanced out with high physical resistance and decent melee defense stats. Both of these will be another reflection of speed, and as far as physical resistance is concerned, I think warriors will have a certain base amount, while demons will have a significantly higher amount, because the latter are magical as well as fast. Demonic units are all likely to cause fear at the very least, if not terror, and they'll be immune to psychology as well. And while higher tier warrior units might be immune to psychology too, the less capable units, I think, will be pretty easy to break. On which note, I think demons and warriors could have an interesting distinction in that demons might act more like undead units when morale is low, whereas warriors will behave like regular units. That's to say, warriors will rout and flee, while demons will disintegrate, except for the unbreakable ones, of course. I also think that while only some warrior units might cause magical damage, all demonic units will likely cause magical damage, and I wouldn't be surprised if they all also caused some damage over time, either to health or morale, in the form of Chaos Corruption as well. I wouldn't be surprised to see the missile unit categories completely removed from Slaanesh either. Outside of music, I can't imagine engaging the enemy from a long distance is fulfilling enough for a Slaaneshi cultist or demon. Is it really fun to kill your enemies if you don't end up 
covered with their blood and guts. Finally, I was a really big fan of some of the top level faction mechanics we saw on the battlefield in Warhammer 2, like uh, Murderous Prowess for the Dark Elves or the Realm of Souls for the Tomb Kings, and I think we'll see more of the same in Warhammer 3. Slanashi tie into battle is, of course, the idea of excess. Excess violence and the beauty of battle is an art and ultimate pleasure. So, perhaps the Slaneshi faction has a bar that fills up as more killing takes place, and when the number of battlefield deaths from either side of the battle goes past a certain ratio, a summon is unlocked. A bar with multiple stages makes sense. At each stage, a more powerful summon is unlocked, but when that summon is used, the bar gets emptied, or maybe the bar represents the time for which the summon stays on the field. This reflects that worship of excess. The more you kill before calling upon the demons, the more powerful a demon you'll get, or the longer you'll get it for. For Slanesh, I think this summon would appear from thin air. No need to sacrifice a unit or anything like that. And yes, I think this summon would be available multiple times in a battle, so as a player, you have to decide between more summons of weaker demons or fewer summons of more powerful ones. I think you could see anything from an extra unit of demonettes on the lower side of things and, I don't know, maybe a greater demon, a keeper of secrets, or something wilder on the, uh, the more expensive side of things. But enough talk of generic mechanics, let's get specific. I highly doubt the Dark Gods themselves will be present in-game as anything more than references in the text. Instead, we're going to see their bidding executed by their champions, demons, warriors, and worshippers. If we're expecting two legendary lords for each faction at launch with a total of four, the demons of Slanesh might eventually be associated with a Sigvald rework, but there are many champions and demons to choose from to provide fresh content at launch. I would be pretty disappointed if a Sigvald rework takes up one of the leader slots at launch. Save that for later. At launch, I'd like to see Nakari, who's almost a given considering he was mentioned in both Krokgar and Archon the Black's campaigns, and perhaps the less developed Stirkar of the Source Veneer, one of the lieutenants of Archaon. The Mask is also an option, and it's quite possible we get Dekala and Azazel as well, I think that's how you pronounce that, uh, but I do think they'll make for good DLC instead, and that's a conversation we'll have in a different video. For the purpose of today's conversation, let's say that we're going to launch with Nakari and Stierkar. It's no secret that Nakari, to put it lightly, has history with the High Elves. And not just any High Elves, but Enerion and his heirs, having been slain and banished back to the Realm of Chaos on multiple occasions, twice if I recall, by Enerion himself, and later by his twin heirs Teclas and Tyrion. Twin heirs who are still very much alive outside of the High Elf ending to Warhammer 2 and upon whom Nakari may seek vengeance. In keeping with my theory that the base game map will be the Northern Hemisphere, give or take a few degrees latitude, this Nakari vs. Heirs of Anarion situation could make for a compelling storyline and subplot in the greater context of the end of the world. And let's not forget the other heir of Anarion, Malekith. So, Nakari could easily be pit against the High Elves and Dark Elves alike. Originally a High Elf in the Cult of Pleasure, Nakari eventually found favor with Slanesh and replaced Dekala as the preferred servant of the Ruinous Power. Thanks to the strange workings of Chaos though, Nakari proceeds to be spawned in the past as a Keeper of Secrets and partakes in many important founding events of the Warhammer fantasy world, including early Chaos incursions where he developed that hatred for Anerion and his kin. Now if memory serves right, Nakari was involved when the Great Vortex from Warhammer 2 was brought into existence, so we're talking about a very powerful and ancient demon here. Nakari is a Keeper of Secrets, a type of greater demon of Slanesh, so let's first talk about the Keeper of Secrets in a generic sense and how it might be represented as a generic lord, and we'll build on that conversation for the named variant in Nakari. A Keeper of Secrets relishes fear and lust above all else, though it'll take any base mortal pleasure it can get. A Keeper of Secrets is said to particularly enjoy ripping people away from their absolute pleasure in the hopes of leaving them broken-minded. Each looks different, based on the whims and desires of Slanesh when one is made, and while some look beautiful, others might look beastly and bovine. 
with two pairs of arms, one set being pincered, and long, lithe limbs, a Keeper of Secrets is swift beyond compare and very capable in melee combat. The mere arrival of a Keeper of Secrets on the mortal plane can drive the inclined to push themselves further than ever before. Artists create masterpieces beyond their mortal skill. Poets reach new heights of lyrical aptitude. Singers sing with voices beautiful enough to shatter hearts. Mortals dream of beauty and unachievable perfection, bringing about sadness and disappointment in that lack of perfection when they wake. And as the demon comes ever closer, these effects grow to sickening depths of depravity. Painters paint with their own blood, writers gouge out their own eyes so as to understand what darkness truly means, and singers choke on their own voices. Madness takes over the minds of mortals, driving warriors to abandon their posts to please their newfound master by any means necessary. And the Keeper of Secrets knows this, and uses this to gain pleasure at the expense of its slaves. But when the Keeper of Secrets leaves, every mind and body that was touched is left hollow and completely unfulfilled by any sensation that follows. A Keeper of Secrets is fast and it moves effortlessly, dancing about the battlefield with grace despite being a large entity. Expect something the size of Durthu or Kolek, but moving at high speeds and perhaps with a strider trait allowing it to completely ignore terrain penalties. It is a demon, so one can expect it will cause fear and terror, and it might also bring physical resistance, if not ward saves, and since it's Slaneshi, we might see it with little to no armor. Decent melee stats would reflect its demonic capabilities, and the pincers can easily break armor and bone alike, suggesting a decently armor-piercing weapon strength. I also suspect area of effect buffing and debuffing to be in constant supply with the Keeper of Secrets. Allies might be driven to perfection in combat, resulting in higher weapon damage as each blow lands as desired perfectly on the enemy, while enemies might see a significant drop in speed as they draw close to the Keeper of Secrets, refusing to move away from his reach. Magical capabilities will likely be expressed in the form of bound abilities, and while I think some will be from the demon lore of Slanesha, topic we'll touch on later, I think others might be unique to the Keeper of Secrets. I can see at least one hex to cast on enemy units to force them into a rampage as they seek out pleasures that can only be got through beautiful combat. And I can picture an augment that further bolsters allies, perhaps giving them the gift of extra speed or charge bonus, driving them into battle with more passion. And finally, I can see another hex that targets single entity units, a way to freeze them in place momentarily by beguiling them invading their minds with beautiful visions and drawing them towards the Keeper of Secrets, pinning them in place. Finally, a Keeper of Secrets is said to derive pleasure from pain, so I wouldn't be surprised to see some type of trait that allows it to cause more damage when health is below 20% or so, making it an even more dangerous enemy when badly hurt. Building on that, Nakari is likely to exhibit the pinnacle of all Slaneshi attributes while twisting the hearts and minds of foes and friends alike from a distance and stripping flesh from bone up close. Apart from better stats overall and perhaps bound abilities that last longer or amplify the damage they do in stats or health, Nakari might also be able to summon lesser demons to do his bidding, a reference to his ability to more or less single-handedly sustain the Chaos Invasion during the Rape of Ulthuan, one of his invasions in an attempt to eliminate the heirs of Anerion. Since Nakari was twice done in by fire, magical as it was, I wonder if he'll have a slight weakness to fire and maybe even a weakness to magical damage. Maybe not something too significant, but something that could be capitalized on with the help of Kindle Flame or with enough focused magical damage. It sounds counterintuitive to a demonic entity, but it's the one glaring weakness of Nakari, at least one that is most evident based on my own readings. I don't think any mount options are going to be made available to a being so large, but I do think a few quest items are possible. In campaign, they might be unlocked by killing the heirs of Anerion, but what they'd be, I'm not certain. A greater demon doesn't really have use for mortal weapons, so I wonder if instead Nakari's quest items are in the form of souls that unlock special abilities. Collecting Tyrion might remove the weakness to fire. Collecting Teclas might strengthen magical capabilities, and collecting Malekith might strengthen melee capabilities. 
I don't know. It's hard to scale a greater demon up from where they should start, so I'm curious to see what you guys think might be used as quest items for these legendary greater demon lords of chaos. Now, Nakari will be a formidable choice on the battlefield, and I imagine he'll be a major part of the push during the marketing of Warhammer 3, but let's move on to our other contender. Compared to talk of greater demons, a mere champion seems like a laughable idea, but I think the warrior counterpart to each demonic faction is an essential element to bring some interesting gameplay variety and options. Also, I think demon princes will be kept separate from greater demons like the Keeper of Secrets, and I think that class of lords will be added as DLC in both named and generic variants later. So work with me here, let's humor the thought for the sake of variety at launch. The son of his tribe's chief, Stierkar of the Swords Veneer, was guided from birth by the demon Slezuzu. This demon would only show itself to him under the promise of secrecy, a promise that Stierkar kept, not revealing the existence of this demon to anybody. In turn, Slezuzu told Stierkar exactly how to behave and what to say in order to win the adoration of his people, and the boy grew to be a very popular man. Ultimately, he killed his father to take his place at the head of the tribe and became one with the demon Slezuzu, becoming a champion of Slanesh. He was gifted a demonic steed, slew one of Archaon's lieutenants, and took his place. In the end times, Stierkar was Sigval's second in command, ultimately dying in battle, but he did make it to the end times, and must have been a fairly formidable fighter. But before we talk about the named variant, let's discuss the generic lord type. The Chaos Lord in the first game provides a good baseline template off of which each Chaos Champion will be built, I think. Mix that with touches from Prince Sigvald, and we're looking at the generic Chaos Champion of Slanesh. So, in other words, strip the Chaos Lord of a bit of armor, add a touch of physical resistance, but not too much because you want to balance the fact that they will have some armor and they have a shield as well. Then add the Strider trait to reflect the grace with which they dance on the battlefield and give them an immunity to psychology as well, and you're pretty well done. Perhaps the encouraged trait to go with it all, of course they are a leader, uh, and we're also likely to see a spellcasting variant using the demon lore of Slanesh, and maybe access to other lores of magic for alternate variants as well. Dark magic, shadow, death, they seem most likely. Steer car of the Swords Veneer is likely to be melee focused, with sword in one hand and shield in the other. It's possible that we see a Sarkhan-like implementation of the demon within, where Stierkar allows her to take over his body to unlock certain bound abilities at the cost of draining his life. Alternatively, it's possible that their relationship is a lot more united. They are one, after all, so perhaps Stierkar will be blessed with some demonic abilities without any of the cost. I imagine he'll be an expert duelist, similar to Sigvald, but unlike Sigvald, Stierkar will have access to a mount with his demonic steed of Slanesh. This should allow him to chase down mounted enemy lords and characters to battle them. I suspect we'll see bound abilities that improve his fighting capabilities, buffing melee attack and defense stats, as well as weapon damage, again reflecting that drive for delivering the perfect blow with every strike. Abilities like Deadly Onslaught, Foe Seeker, and Standard Die seem very likely, and we might also see an immunity to psychology while causing fear, but maybe not terror. Let's not forget, there is a demon inside him, and that will surely have an effect on people. For his quest items, I can see his suit of armor being of particular importance. Uh, if I recall correctly, that was another gift from Slanesh, and beyond that, he might be tasked to battle other Chaos Champions that serve rival gods, something he had become quite adept at doing. In fact, his killing of Archaon's former lieutenant might be part of his campaign. Not as complicated a choice as Nakari by any means, but as I said earlier, this allows for a slightly different start position and also an option that is vastly different from Nakari. As far as the rest of the roster is concerned, I think we can expect a lot of familiar Norskin and Warriors of Chaos units, though with an added twist for each of the gods' rosters, and then we'd see the addition of god-aligned units as well. So, as far as heroes are concerned, I think we'll see exalted heroes, shamans, and sorcerers of various lores of magic, including the demon lore of Slanesh. Again, keep in mind that 
These would all be modified a little, not only visually to reflect blessings of Slanesh, by which I mean mutations, uh, but we're also likely to see stats and abilities reflect the same as well. Vanguard deployment, physical resistance, etc, etc, the things that we discussed earlier. I'd like to see some more upgraded units from the standard roster as well. For example, a generic Forsaken hero, touched by Slanesh, or perhaps a Keeper of Secrets, having seen and experienced the pure bliss of magnificent combat, only to be tossed aside and discarded like an improperly used sock. Like I said earlier, this leaves mortals hollow, chasing after that high, never quite able to feel the same way again. These mutated beings, as such, hunger for battle and perfection in bloodshed, likely with frenzy and high melee attack stats, but with reduced melee defense stats to show their careless chase of the high. Higher speeds and a bit of physical resistance might make them a bit more likely to survive, and they'd probably cause fear at the very least, and I can imagine them with a guardian trait. This would be a reflection not of their dedication to the person they're guarding per se, but more so their dedication to Slanesh, throwing themselves into danger in the hopes of once more gaining favor and tasting from that well of infinite and otherwise unattainable pleasure. I think heralds are very likely to be seen as generic heroes. The demonet is synonymous with Slanesh, and the herald of Slanesh is basically a demonet on steroids, or again, perhaps more fittingly, meth. Now, we might be entering into some Age of Sigmar stuff here, but... I'm basically using it as a surrogate for Creative Assembly's creative license to make up some new stuff to add depth to these factions. Beautiful and seductive as can be expected, the Herald of Slanesh is a demonet that has impressed Slanesh, and those that do a particularly good job of impressing Slanesh might be gifted a Steed of Slanesh or perhaps even a Seeker Chariot, an Exalted Seeker Chariot, or a Hellflare Chariot. These will certainly be mount options if the Herald is present in the roster. Expect near nudity, by which I mean extremely low armor, but increased physical resistance to balance it out. I imagine we'll also get something similar to the Madness of Cain. In melee, the Herald has a chance to inflict some form of seduction upon her enemies, driving them into a rampage as they seek to please her through battle. Heralds might also have something along the lines of distracting beauty, an aura effect that reduces enemy melee attack and defense stats as they're distracted by the beguiling figure. Alluruses, Heartseekers, and Exalted Alluruses are also demonets who've gained favor with Slanesh, but they rank lower than the Herald, and I don't think we'll see them at launch, but we're likely to see them when the inevitable DLC comes that adds more units to Slanesh and Korn. However, I do think we'll see a variant of the Herald with some minimal magic casting capabilities at the cost of melee capabilities. The Inferno Enrapturus is a support hero I'd like to see, and yes, now we're right in Age of Sigmar territory, but I think this is a fitting addition to the battlefield for Slaneshi demons. A subcategory of heralds, these are exceptional musicians who fill the battlefield with discordant music to bring pain and elation alike, and will maybe be one of the few ranged units on the Slaneshi roster. They'd likely provide ranged magical damage capabilities, firing discordant tones at foes, forcing them to turn to madness, bleeding from their ears with the pain induced by the music directed at them, most likely dubstep. But this is only their secondary purpose. Their primary purpose would be to bring buffs and debuffs to the battlefield. On the one hand, they can be used to distract the enemy, reducing their melee stats, or perhaps slowing them down as they try to escape. On the other, they can drive allies to fight with greater vigor and passion, buffing their melee stats. And on the third hand, perhaps they're even able to cast summoning spells. Lesser demons and chaos furies might be brought to the field as the music of the infernal enrapturous not only pleases Slanesh, but perhaps also weakens the barrier between the mortal realm and the immortal realm. The other unit categories will largely be dominated by units from the Warriors of Chaos faction, though again, each will be visually and mechanically changed to feel more like a Slaneshi variant. From color schemes to armor, and from Vanguard deployment ability to speed, we're going to see these Warriors of Chaos lean towards the overall themes that we discussed earlier. I also expect to see more mutations across the board from here on out, especially for the higher tier units like the Chosen. Expect tentacles and long tongues and bovine features. I also expect a greater mix of sexes being represented, including more androgynous looking models. The idea here being the higher tier units have been blessed by Slanesh 
more than the lower tier units. The only new melee infantry unit we might see is the Demonette, hermaphroditic demons serving Slanesh. Like I said earlier, they're very synonymous with Slanesh. The Dark God's preference for elven souls shows through here, as most, if not all, Demonettes were originally elves that had been twisted into demons. Kept alive by feeding on emotions and sensations, Demonettes are particularly passionate about partaking in battle as it literally keeps them alive. These will likely be the fastest Slaneshi melee infantry unit on the field, and while I imagine their damage output will be substantial, they'll likely melt pretty quickly, especially under heavy magical damage. We might see a variant of the Demonette that has extra powerful pincers, this would translate into armor piercing or perhaps armor rending damage, and since Demonettes are supposed to be extremely attractive or alluring, I suspect we might get an ability similar to the Witch Elves Madness of Cain, just induced by beauty rather than toxins. Enemy troops enraptured by the beauty of Demonettes might turn to a rampage or might otherwise be pinned in place with reduced melee stats. Monstrous Infantry might see the addition of some generic Slaneshi demons, showcasing some new Slaneshi inspired monsters. Don't really have any ideas beyond that. But I think the melee cavalry category will be completely revamped for Slaanesh. We'll definitely see the addition of the Seeker of Slaanesh, Demonettes atop Steeds of Slaanesh, and these are extremely fast bipedal beasts with poisonous tongues. This will be among the fastest cavalry units on the battlefield, able to vanguard deploy and shut down stray archers and artillery units with great ease, but needing to pull away before anything anti-large comes their way. Quick and devastating as they may be, they'll likely be coming in with very low melee defense, making them susceptible to quick death. I suspect they'll need a fair bit of micromanaging, but their poison damage will assist other units engaged in melee and prevent foes from easily escaping, making them ideal flanking and support units on any battlefield. We'll probably also see the Pleasure Seeker added in the melee cavalry category. These consist of demonettes riding a different type of steed of Slaanesh, mutated to be more snake-like. Larger than their Seeker of Slaanesh counterpart, they're slower, but harder hitting. Finally, we're likely to see the Hellstriders of Slaanesh, a blended unit featuring Chaos Marauders riding atop a steed of Slaanesh. I think we'll see a fair number of variants here, including a Sword and Shield variant, a Great Sword variant, a halberd variant, and a whip variant. The first few are self-explanatory, melee focused, armor piercing focused, and anti-large armor piercing focused respectively. The whip variant might either be a regiment of renown or might just be a support variant that not only acts as a good attacking unit, but also inspiring nearby allies to perform better. There's just something about a whip that probably gets the average Slaneshi warrior going, if you catch my meaning. Hellstriders are weak-willed men who have been gifted their steeds by Slaanesh in a vain attempt to achieve greatness. The promise of glory sees them permanently mounted on their steeds, sometimes with their weapons permanently fused to their bodies, riding from battle to battle, enjoying the exhilaration of the kill, but suffering from withdrawal immediately after battle. Each of their kills is a sacrifice to Slaanesh, and I wouldn't be surprised to see an Enrage or Berserk-like mechanic for these guys, something that makes them better in battle the longer they stay engaged in combat, with multiple tiers increasing melee attack, defense, and physical resistance as combat continues. Again, this is to represent their thirst and hunger for battle in a constant flow. Chariots will include Seeker Chariots, Hellflayer Chariots, and Exalted Seeker Chariots, each one drawn by Steeds of Slaanesh with Demonettes riding atop. The Seeker Chariot would be the lowest tier anti-infantry capable unit here, with the Exalted Seeker Chariot and Hellflayer Chariot both boasting anti-infantry and armor piercing capabilities. The Hellflayer Chariot might be a slower variant, and the story behind the unit is quite hilarious. Originally, it was a punitive measure. Demonettes who had upset Slaanesh were forced to ride these chariots following behind the battle, turning corpses to mulch. One day, a particularly rowdy set of demonettes decided to take the thing on a joyride, and I expect these ladies to show up as a regiment of renown. This joyride proved fruitful in battle as they crashed through enemy lines, causing more death and devastation, and ever since, the Hellflare Chariot has been upgraded to a more honorable role. Among the monsters and beasts, we are likely to see Chaos Furies added, though I think each Chaos God will have specific versions aligned to them. These are winged beasts with dragon-like faces, 
weakest of the lesser demons and perhaps capable in nothing more than harassing enemy artillery and ranged units. Typically, Chaos Furies are undivided, they have no allegiances, but I do think the game will create Furies who have no allegiances and a variant that's aligned with the god you're playing for. I think we'll also see Feral Steeds of Slanesh, unmounted variants that are more likely to rampage and run amok, but fast and cheap chaff troops that cause poison damage with their poisonous tongues. Among the rare monsters and beasts, I think we'll see just one new addition at launch, and that'll be the Fiend of Slanesh. These foul beasts tower over their enemies, combining the bovine with elements of scorpions, humans, and reptiles alike. A venomous stinger accompanies massive pincers, and the four humanoid hooved legs help it charge swiftly through battle, cleaving anything that gets in its way, singing songs only few can hear, driving those that stand by mad. All this said, and their impressive size aside, the fiends are actually not the greatest fighters, relying instead on their ability to emit pheromones that dull the senses of their enemies, and then stalking up and striking quickly to feed. We might, as such, see a unit with stalking or unspottable, vanguard deployment, and an area of effectability that reduces enemy melee stats. A great support unit that can occasionally dive in to cause some solid damage alongside a more potent poison damage than usual, perhaps slowing the enemy down to a near standstill, but if bogged down by ranged fire or anti-large units, it might quickly melt away. It might also exhibit more support capabilities. Its singing might disrupt the winds of magic, increasing miscast chances of enemy casters, and its mere presence might bolster the abilities of nearby lesser demons like demonettes and the like. We might see some alternative greater demons of Slanesh as well, and I'd initially thought the Keeper of Secrets might fit in here, but I think they're better left leading armies. So the question remains, what else might fit in here? Anything at launch, or will some of the juicier demons be unleashed with DLC? And that's all the talk of units for the day, I think, at least from me. As always, I'd like to know your thoughts as far as the roster is concerned. I know I tend to have wackier ideas at times, but that's part of the fun and speculation. So let me know in the comments what you think we might be seeing with regards to lords, units, and mechanics as a whole. Meanwhile, I'm going to turn our eyes to the campaign map, starting positions, and campaign mechanics. Each of the Chaos Gods are likely to have at least one starting position in the Realm of Chaos, or as close to it as the game map allows. This starting position will likely be given to the Demonic Legendary Lord option, in the case of Slanesh, Nakari. The Realm of Chaos is the region beyond the Northern Wastes emanating originally from the site of the Polar Gate to the north. Northern tribes see the Realm of Chaos as a place of pilgrimage, given their worship of the Dark Gods, and their people will often travel towards the Pole in the hope of gaining glory and favor with the gods. The Norskins, the Kurgan, the Hung, and many smaller tribes surround the region, doing their Dark Gods' bidding, while the gods themselves partake in the eternal battle at and around the Pole, where logic and reason are thrown aside, and the material world and the Realm of Chaos blend. Each god has their own territory in this constantly shifting realm, with Slanesh having claim over the smallest but most defensible of territories. A region completely devoted to him, with a glittering palace where he resides, surrounded by the practice of every excess ever created by man. It is in this part of the realm of chaos that Slanesh watches over contests of excess from which he chooses his champions. Without a fortress to defend himself, Slanesh instead relies on six rings of temptation around his palace of pleasure. Any would-be attacker has to travel through these rings without falling to their temptations, a feat not easily accomplished. At the center of it all awaits the Dark Prince, young and beguiling, and of indeterminate gender, though typically seen more, like I said earlier, as male than female. But even then, when one reaches Slanesh, gazing upon him only results in an eternity of damnation, enslaved to his desires. The Realm of Chaos is, quite truly, a Realm of Chaos, changing at every glance, constantly shifting, betraying all logic and limitations of the real world, the Realm of Chaos literally shifts constantly, 
I want to see this implemented in game, with entire provinces shattering and shifting every few turns, making war in the realm of chaos a strange affair, as reinforcing armies might sometimes find themselves pushed apart from one another, and as neighboring territories under the same owner might shift away as time goes on, with only the chaos factions being able to hold them together with the blessings of their gods. Being an outsider invading the lands of the gods themselves should be a difficult ordeal, the hardest endgame scenario ever brought by the Total War Warhammer series, at least for the forces of order. At the beginning, I think Nakari will start with a small army of mostly demonic units under his command just outside of Dark Elf territory in the Chaos Wastes. Rather than strike the High Elves on Ulthuan first, Nakari might battle the Dark Elves looking to end Malekith before chasing after Tyrion on Ulthuan and Teclis off the coast of Lustria. A second start position for Slaanesh could be to the south, off the coast of Lustria. If Steerkar of the Sorts of Anir seeks to please Slaanesh, he might be off to do his bidding and bring more elven souls to the Dark Prince. Teclis to the south makes a viable first target in a campaign against all elven kind, including the Wood Elves of the Old World, who will likely be a target for Stirkar as well. These factions can be hordes, or preferably they act like regular factions capturing settlements in one way or another. I'd actually like to see the latter, and that's not just because I think horde gameplay is typically lackluster, but more so because I think some interesting decision making can be introduced here. In the case of Chaos Demons and their warrior counterparts, I think we could see an intriguing option when capturing a city. Apart from opting to raise the city, might this new conquest be a settlement or a place of worship? While the former would be crucial to economy and the recruitment of lower tier warrior units and agents, slowly spreading chaos corruption, the latter might corrupt the land much more quickly and open up the opportunity to recruit higher tier units in the form of demons or demonic agents. Consecrating the land in such a way would certainly come with negatives as well, but it would be a way of justifying the demons and their sustainability in the material plane. In the case of Slaanesh, these sites of worship might simply amount to massive pleasure pits where people commit acts that I can't describe for fear of being demonetized by the dark gods of YouTube. Both of these city types should have corresponding upgrades. Again, the settlements would be more traditional cities, while the sites of worship would focus entirely on the hedonistic charms of Slaanesh. Drug dens, pleasure palaces, brothels, all the usual makings of a good Friday night. Apart from recruitment and economic considerations, the latter should also influence the blessings of the Dark Gods and the strength of said gods at any given time in the campaign. The distribution of power in the Chaos Wastes are said to wax and wane, reflecting the relative power of the Dark Gods influenced by the actions of mortals and their fueling of the darkness. In its simplest form, I think this will likely translate to faction-wide buffs and debuffs. This distribution might change at random, or it might be paired with events that involve some light decision-making. That is to say, when Slaanesh is waxing, you might see some buffs when you're playing as the demons of Slaanesh, but when Slaanesh is waning, you might see some debuffs. With a bit more involvement, we might see a good old-fashioned number line bar that fills and depletes over time based on actions that are taken, including, for example, the building and upgrading of these sites of worship I was just mentioning. Take a look at this visual aid I've put together here. The waxing and waning should directly affect the efficiency of demonic elements in armies, buffing or debuffing their stats, weakening their replenishment rates, or perhaps even causing attrition when waning. Beyond that, it should also influence things like public order. To the people, it might represent the happiness or dissatisfaction of the gods, and that's sure to cause issues. An interesting way to implement waxing and waning might involve a contest of numbers between the player god and the opposing god. So, for example, if Cornate factions are performing better than Slaneshi factions, Slaneshi influence would be waning. But if Slaneshi factions are performing better than Cornate factions, Slaneshi influence would be waxing. That kind of builds a dynamic that I don't think we've seen before that has you competing with factions you might not be currently at war with in an attempt to become stronger, gain those buffs, and perform better overall in the campaign. The gifts of the Dark Gods should also make an appearance as a mechanic. Every once in a while, the faction should be tasked with accomplishing an ordeal. 
This basically becomes a mission-giving mechanic, but with twists. On completing the ordeal, a gift will be given to the faction. On failing it, however, a punishment will be given instead. Disappointing Slanesh comes with consequences, as he is not known to be a very forgiving god. I think both gifts and punishments can come in the form of assignable items. Gifts and punishments can be anything from mutations to actual physical items, though they shouldn't take up equipment slots, instead being registered as attributes or traits on a character. And they should be a compulsory assignment when received. Perhaps denying a gift of the Dark God is possible, though it would be at an extremely high cost. Finally, beyond banners and marks of chaos, the Chaos Factions should have mutations available as assignable items as well. Unlike others, these assignments should be permanently attached to the unit, dying with them, and they should be easily attained to promote their usage. Mutations for Slanesh can be anything from tentacles that give a regular unit splash damage, to hooved legs that give them vastly increased speed, to more arms that give them higher melee attack stats. There are tons of mutations that work for Slanesh, there are hundreds if not thousands of ways to implement mechanical buffs, visual changes, and other interesting elements using mutations on the battlefield. I think rights ought to make a comeback in Game 3 as well. In times like this, rights by forces of good and evil alike make sense, and for Slanesh, I can picture rights that range from summoning especially powerful demonic agents, to massive orgies that help increase Slaneshi influence, to options that cause attrition in neighboring provinces to reflect the allure of Slaneshi temptations, drawing soldiers away from duty. Demonic agents I can see from Slaanesh include the Herald that spread corruption and perhaps can be used to damage garrisons and units, and the Infernal Enrapturous who I can see spreading corruption and perhaps wounding enemy lords and characters, and by wounding, I mean seducing and temporarily taking them out of commission. I don't think we'll be seeing a Keeper of Secrets or other greater demons walking around without an army, I just feel like that would just look horribly out of place. Now, units and campaign mechanics discussed, let's wrap things up quickly with brief talk of magic. The demon lore of Slanesh will be a lot more reliant on support type spells with primary focus on hexes and augments. The lore attribute as such might be along the lines of the Demons of Chaos, an ability that provides regeneration to all demonic units on the field while casting. This regeneration would first heal models that are still standing and then proceed to bring back dead entities to represent the arrival of new demons on the battlefield. The Lash of Slanesh would be a wind spell that travels in a straight line, causing armor-piercing physical devastation over a short distance. Acquiescence would come in as a hex spell, significantly slowing down a single targeted enemy unit, preventing their escape. I think an overcasted variant would increase the amount of slowdown rather than provide an area of effect. Pavane of Slanesh would be another direct damage spell, maybe even represented as a musical magic missile, preferably used against single entity units. Hysterical Frenzy should come in as an augment that can target a single friendly unit or an area of effect if overcast, giving the affected unit the frenzy trait to further their damage output. This should, however, come with damage over time to the affected units. The frenzy is, after all, hysterical, so maybe let's reflect that in some way. Then there is Slicing Shards, yet another magic missile, this one coming with multiple missiles, I think, and even more missiles if you were to overcast. Phantasmagoria would be a hex spell, casting images into the targeted unit's minds, with overcast allowing for an area of effect where leadership takes a massive hit, potentially causing mass routes. Finally, Cacophonic Choir would come in as a hex to reduce enemy capabilities in melee, significantly dropping melee attack and defense stats as the targeted unit reacts to the horrible sounds ringing through the air. This would, I think, be a spell that can be overcast to affect an area rather than just a single targeted unit. Slanesh will be, I think, one of the harder Chaos Gods to start as, but I also think we're going to see some interesting mechanics that will make up for that gap in power. Slanesh, after all, is the youngest and presently weakest of the gods, but with the limitless potential to be found in the desires of mortals, Slanesh grows ever stronger. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the conversation today. What here sounds completely unlikely? What do you think is 
actually possible. Any ideas of your own that you'd like to see? Share it all in the comments below. I enjoy reading through other people's theories, so I'd love to see them. Make sure you subscribe to the channel to follow along with more speculation, as well as early coverage of Total War Warhammer 3 as soon as it becomes possible, and of course, more strategy gaming content as well. A massive thanks goes out to all of my channel members and patrons for supporting the channel on a monthly basis, and a big ol' thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.